Conscious Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Sheila Bassi Kellett, the outgoing city manager for the city of Yellowknife. Sheila has been a dedicated and visionary leader who has made significant contributions to the advancement of local government administration in the territory. With a commitment to inspiring and leading the way for city employees to continuously improve the delivery of programs and services to residents, visitors, and business owners, Sheila has established herself as a prominent figure in the field of municipal management. In her role as city manager, Sheila has demonstrated a profound understanding of administrative leadership. Through her tenure, Sheila has remained committed to the smooth and efficient operation of the municipality. She tirelessly works to explore and develop new, more efficient ways to administer city programs, constantly seeking opportunities for innovation and improvement. Under her leadership, the city of Yellowknife has witnessed notable advancements in service delivery and operational efficiency, enhancing the overall quality of life for residents and fostering a vibrant environment for businesses. Through her tireless effort and innovative initiatives, Sheila continuously makes a lasting and positive impact on the community she has served. So with that, Sheila, welcome to the Political Trenches. Well, thank you so much, Chris. I'm kind of humbled by that. Who are you talking about? Because <laughs> uh, sure, you know that the world of municipal governance is not glamorous at the best of times, and it's one that is rarely praised. Right? We always hear about, ah, my garbage pickup was late and raccoons got into it. What's wrong with you people? Um, so it's really thank you. That was a very, very lovely, and I'm very humbled by what you said. We're really pleased to have you here, Sheila. It's, and we should probably wrap up about now, actually, after that introduction. Just <laughs> yeah, say, <that>. okay, <laughs> it's all downhill from here. We, uh, we, we, as I mentioned, we are just starting off on a kind of a cross Canada tour of, of the experience of local government in various ter in all the territories and in the provinces as well. And we're starting with the Northwest Territories. And given the esteem with which Chris has written up about you, it seems to make great sense that we start with Yellowknife. So with that in mind, uh, we, we'll go back and forth a little bit, some questions. And since we are talking about local government, how did you end up a CAO or city manager in Yellowknife? Oh, through a long and, and uh, winding road, let's put it that way. I'm really fortunate. I, I grew up in Toronto and I went to university in Ontario and I didn't feel like going back to Toronto when I was done. And I, on a whim, ended up in Yellowknife. And uh, did a whole bunch of things that one does in their 20s, which were very irresponsible, uh, but ended up being hired to do contract work on a really interesting project that was led by a minister of the government of the Northwest Territories at the time. His, his vision being that local governments needed to have the respect and authority in the Northwest Territories and be recognized as the prime public authority at the community level by other orders of government. And what a great project to be a part of, right? I mean, this is this is a million years ago that I'm talking about now. But at the time, it was about empowering and strengthening the, the, the role of local governments and recognizing that. So that was a pretty seminal start to my career. I'm really blessed that that was it, that it wasn't something like, you know, uh, research, you know, morgues in small communities or something like that. I got, a, I got to do a pretty sweet topic. And um, my career went all kinds of places after that. I was a self-government negotiator. I was a, a, a director of uh, lots of things in the department in the government of the Northwest Territories that deals with municipal and community affairs. And that was great to see from the government point of view. Uh, ended up as a deputy minister for a period of time in the government overseeing human resources and uh, left that to do my own consulting work. And it was eye-opening to work with a lot of local governments. And what I found was um, I engage with people way too much to have my own little home office where I sit by myself. And so the opportunity at the city of Yellowknife came up and I'd been so passionate about local government and the recognition about local government that I applied and was really happy to take on this role in 2017. And honest to God, it's been the best, the, 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 the most exciting career path uh, has been the last seven years. Um, I also had the joy of being a, a city, I forgot to mention this, a CAO in a very small remote community in the Northwest Territories many years ago. But I, I think to myself, uh, I think it's me. I'm going to break this to you now. Uh, in that community in 1995, there was a massive forest fire. Uh, full evacuation of that community had to happen. And lo and behold, 2023, fast forward to Yellowknife, we had, again, the mass evacuation of the capital city, which was 
unheard of, un, un, inconceivable before that happened. So I think two mass evacuations due to fires in one career is quite enough. Um, the local government level, I can't say enough. This is where we live our choices. And it always strikes me as funny if someone says, oh, you know, the old uh, dirt dumps and dogs. That's all you guys deal with. It's so banal, blah, blah. Um, this is where life is real. This is where if you want to really think about uh, the impacts of urban sprawl and you want to limit what the greenhouse gas emissions look like and what our carbon footprint is, what better place to do that than in things like the zoning bylaw? where we have the opportunity to limit urban sprawl. Like this is where it becomes real. You can talk about policy decisions that, uh, that are done at other orders of government, but this is where it's real. And we have the ability to make that impact on people's lives. Flip side of the coin is everyone is an expert in what we do, right? Mm -hmm. If I heard one more person <laughs> during COVID say, you know, cause we were very uh, watching, of course, what goes on at our solid waste facility, we have one of the very few solid waste facilities in in North America, at least for sure, that allows public access for the purpose of salvaging. People can go in and salvage uh, to the extent that a filmmaker from New York came and made a film about the city of Yellowknife's dump. So you can imagine people have a very uh, many residents feel very a strong sense of ownership and pride and they're very proprietary about the solid waste facility. So imagine during COVID when we had to shut public access down. And if I had one more email saying, hey, you bunch of stupid heads, it's a hole in the ground that you put garbage in, like, duh, what's the problem? Um, people people feel like they know what goes on at the municipal level. They don't understand that it's a really complex regulatory framework that we operate within. We're seeking to constantly balance the interests of our residents with inadequate money, with the issues around our infrastructure pressures. It's such a balancing act in the world of risk management that that's what we do day in and day out. But it's so exciting at the same time because you never know what's on the other end of the phone, right? So it's everything from the big heavy issues to, did, did you know, sports tourism. There is a, an actual real organization out there that deals with arm wrestling and it's an organized sport and they wanna come to Yellowknife. And my goodness, I cannot think of a better thing uh, they want to pair it up with rib fest. Like these are the things that come across my desk. Like how, how, how I did not come to work that day thinking that was going to be that arm wrestling and rib fest were going to be something um, that would factor into my day, but there you go. And I think that's part of the joy of what you do as a city manager, that you have the ability to work with a team of people who are in, in the, in the community and they are the best ambassadors for the community. Right. And so whether or not it's a lifeguard teaching a toddler how to swim, or it's the, the water and sewer guy that's stopping the water break in some residential neighborhood. Our staff are out there all the time and people see them all the time. And it's work that is meaningful in people's lives. So it is nothing short of an honor to be able to work for a municipal government and to be able to be in your community and do things to support your community to be a great place. Oh, wow, that passion is obvious and eloquent. I really liked your comment around dumps, dirt and dogs. I hadn't heard that before. I have when we take deal with the when we work in Australia, we hear about roads, rates, and rubbish. So it's all very alliterative. Anyway, so specifically, we're doing this round the country tour a little bit. So Yellowknife being the largest in the Northwest Territories and one of the most populous in the North, what sort of unique challenges or opportunities do you see that be, being the hub, regional hub, or territorial hub provides? Well, thanks. For that. It's, a, it's a great question. So we're a capital city. And we're a capital city of 22,000 people. So we're pretty small compared to uh, 22,000 city or co community population in Ontario or BC or any other place. The North is a wondrous place. And so the, the great thing about being capital city here is we're the, we're the crossroads for people from all across the North. So it's culturally really rich. We have indigenous peoples from all across the NWT, from Nunavut that was formerly part of the NWT, Yukon people over here all the time, lots of circumpolar connection. But we are surprisingly multicultural and growing more and more every day. So, you know, I love it. I'm half East Indian. Uh, Diwali is a huge, deep, big, big thing that goes on every fall. So very rich culturally. The, the, the challenges that we have is we're a community of 22,000 that is struggling with the same big city issues that other places have. So I don't care if you're small community population 200 or you're the city of Toronto as a municipality there's some commonalities right in the things that we have to deal with and so I think that the context for the north right now is there is 
post-COVID where we have supply chain issues, we feel it here. Um, that is an impact that we're feeling. We feel the labor crunch as well. We know that there's a number of businesses that are just desperately hanging out their shingle here to see how they can attract people to come and live in the North because there is a perception that we are cold and expensive and cold and dark and expensive. But so let me move that away because we really want to do some proactive work and it's in the books right now that the staff are working on. We are uh, a very sunny city. We're a city where the cost of electricity and housing is a little bit higher. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. Not higher than Vancouver and Toronto, let's put it that way. But we're not, uh, we're higher than some other communities when it comes to the cost of, of housing. And so we're doing some really proactive things right now to try to temper that, whether or not it is, again, looking at using our zoning bylaw as a tool to really encourage densification so that that benefits everybody. If we have a piece of vacant property somewhere that we can either as a city, you know, incentivize that to sell to a developer to put, a, you know, what would have formerly been a single family residential, can you put a fourplex on there? Everybody wins because the infrastructure is there already. You have more people, you've got a higher assessment value that overall brings down the taxes for everybody else. What's not to love? Well, NIMBYs don't love that necessarily. And I'm going to use that as a, you know, that's that's the tough part of the issue right now. I don't think that's unique to Yellowknife. I think that's everyone's dealing with that. So, sorry, I'm blathering on a little bit here and I should be talking more about Yellowknife, but we are really working to confront some of the challenges around that. And so, you know, I have family that comes up. I'm, you know, originally from Toronto. My husband's family is from uh, Southwestern Ontario. They come up and they shake their heads a little bit and go, it, it's not expensive. It's not any more expensive than what we go through. We're not dealing with a HST. We just have a GST, 5%. That's all. It's it, That's helpful because some prices are higher. But for the most part, most things are pretty much on par. And it's a very cosmopolitan city. And there's a lot of demands for good services that come from our residents. So as a winter city, for example, we're now looking at how do you make four season bicycling happen because there's a growing population that does that those people blow my mind i love my bike <laughs> i love my bike in the summer game over uh, but that, that's growing we're in the process of building a new aquatic center our pool right now is one of the most popular facilities but it's not big enough and so every time that it's time to sign up sign your little ones up for swim lessons there's always this like facebook social media has this like oh people are in pain because it's this you know oh i was at 1201 and i missed the boat uh, because it's so popular and it's so oversubscribed right now. So we're building an aquatic center with two basins and we're a winter city. So you know what? In the cold, if people are done with the cold, they need to be able to go and have a place to warm up. I personally, if I could show you outside right now, it is a gorgeous day, bright sunshine. You need sunglasses in yellow light from mid-February onward. Um, it's great skiing right now. People are out snowmobiling. There's, there's so many good things to do outside. I'm a very happy cross-country skier, and there's so much great stuff to do. So the the content, uh, the, the context that we have around being so close to nature is a great thing. And it's wonderful because any place you are in Yellowknife, you are 15 minutes away from a really beautiful hike. Uh, you are 10 minutes away from one of the largest, cleanest, most pristine bodies of water in the world. So there's a lot of great things about living in Yellowknife that I think about my commute to and from work, right? I think I'm able to plan my day out. I don't wear headphones when I walk to or from work because I process my day on the way up, what's going to happen. And on the way home, I process out any of the bad stuff so that when I get home, I'm a nice person and I'm not like, <laughs> oh, you wouldn't believe the jerk that I, ooh, ooh. you know, it, as we all have in our day-to-day -day lives in, in the workplace, sometimes things are really great. And sometimes we have difficult conversations and issues that we have to deal with. So to know that uh, it's a quick walk home and I can be out, you know, skiing on the lake with my dogs or in the summertime, put the kayaks in and, you know, it, it's a, it's a beautiful lifestyle that we're really, really fortunate and really, really blessed to have. What's been the biggest challenge from an administrative standpoint that you've seen creep up over the last seven years, not just in the city of Yellowknife, but I'm assuming you're having conversations with SEOs across the territory. Is there a challenge that you're seeing become more and more prominent and needs to be addressed sooner rather than later to potentially offset some major challenges that municipalities may be faced with dealing with uh, potential no one applying for the administrative jobs, no one wanting to work in a municipality. Is that a concern that the Northwest Territories has or is it everyone just wants a government job so we'll go apply for the government job? 
Chris, you have five hours because that, that's a great question. So, I mean, honestly, um, post COVID, it's it's all all bets are off, right? And so, what we saw during COVID was we were in the Northwest Territories. We were quite fortunate, and we held off on having significant cases of COVID in until 2021. But that was sort of everybody was poised like a jungle cat, waiting to see what would happen at first. Um, COVID's changed the landscape. Um, so certainly when it comes to issues around supply chain, the ability of our economy to be able to shoulder some of that volatility is really pressing. How that translates to a municipality is our um, municipal infrastructure costs are, um, well, let me give you an example. We have, uh, we're gonna be upgrading our fire hall. We've got one fire hall in the city of Yellowknife. It was built in 1989 when we had uh, 16 career firefighters. Population sorry, sorry, has, sorry, sorry. Did you just say you only have one fire hall within we have one the population fire hall, yeah, of, of 22,000? And we have okay. exceedingly talented firefighters. Yep, we have a great team. Um, but that fire hall needs an expansion because it hasn't been worked on for 30 years. So not only do it systems, but it's we've got some sardines happening, right? And, and so we need the expansion for the kind of equipment, for the services that we're delivering now that have expanded since that building was built in 1989. So that's great. So in 2021, we went out, we got a class, uh, or sorry, a design done. We've got a class D estimate, sorry, a design with a ballpark cost at that time by the architect and engineer. And that put it at around 4.5 million. And then when we went out to contractors, we went out to a firm to give us a class D estimate. It's gone up to 16 million. So quadruply, right? So these are, and I don't think this is unusual. This is what's happening because of labor pressures, as you pointed out, Chris, because of the supply chain, because of the cost of doing business now that is just so much different. And so that volatility is carried on. And that's a really challenging thing for us when it comes to municipal infrastructure. The labor market, that's a great one as well. So we've definitely seen a change in that as well. We've had um, more people, we went through a period of time where we had quite a few pe people hungered down. If they were here in 2020, they were happy to stay at the city. We, as many, many employers did, we sent everybody home, be safe. Uh, if you can take a laptop home, that's great. If you're a lifeguard, you can't exactly take a life, you know, your, your, your pool home with you. Uh, it doesn't work well when you're a frontline service delivery, but we don't care. We're going to keep paying you. And we'll figure out how we're going to get you to do things. And people really stepped up. And so, you know, the, the basically the lifeguards were cleaning the aquatic center with a toothbrush. They, they, they were just, they did an amazing job. Everyone wanted to be busy and wanted to do things. Then we went through a period of time where people said, you know what? I am really missing my family in Ontario or in Alberta. And if people weren't from here and hadn't been rooted here, uh, because honestly, I don't, my, I, my family, I met my husband here. We've had a, grown a family here, but who's, you know, I have friends that are like family here now. But if you've only come up here uh, in the last two years or, you know, just had, had a short window of time in Yellowknife, post-COVID, being isolated from family, there was a reckoning that happened. And a lot of people, uh, particularly if they had young kids, said, I got to go closer to family. And so we had a bit of an exodus, and that was really challenging for us. But what we are finding now is, we're a pretty attractive employer. And so in 2024, even though we had a bit of a dramatic year in 2023, we're getting a lot of applicants that are really interested in working for the city and a lot of talent that's coming forward. So I am optimistic on that front, but it's been a cyclical challenge. And you have to find, if your idea of, if your hobbies are going shopping on the weekend uh, to a mall, this might not be the place for you. But if your idea is going on a great hike and being able to eat like amazing uh, food and do some different kinds of activities, um, build a snow castle, right? I mean, you know, there's a snow carving competition that goes on. You want to try some of these things that are just a really unusual and frankly kind of exotic thing to do, then Yellowknife's a great place to do it. We have tourism numbers are back up to pre-COVID, which is amazing. And we have a huge number of uh, particularly... Um, I shouldn't say it started off as a lot of Aurora. It's Aurora view is what's attracting people to come in winter months. And so it used to be mostly South uh, and Asian tourists that were coming. This year, we've seen a record number of Americans, which is great. And Canadians are making their way north because sometimes it's just safe and easy. Right. So that's a great thing about the north. If you come, you stand outside on the ice with a bunch of people. 
at 11 o'clock at night waiting for the sky to light up. And it's kind of goofy when, you know, you're waiting and you're waiting. And when it does light up, it's pretty mind blowing. And so there's just this unique exotic degree about living in the north that makes it great that can counterbalance some of those challenges we have at the municipal level. How do more municipalities in the territory attract talent like yourself? And I'm not trying to blow smoke here, Sheila, at all, but I've got a, it's a serious question because you, you come to the community, you, you born, raised in Toronto and you decide, Hey, I'm going to go up to Yellowknife because the job calls me there. How do how do municipalities keep more talent in a territory, which, um, has I don't want to say negative connotation around it, but there's a negative uh, aura around it that it is a dark, dingy place that no one wants to go, and you're going to drive seven hours before you run into the next community. Is there a thing that municipalities and even city managers and I, I'm going to be corrected here because I just realized that I said S A O, not S E O, or yeah, it's S A O. Sorry, not S E O. I apologize. Ian sent me a strongly worded it. text message saying I got it wrong when I asked that question. But is there a role that the SAO has to play in attracting this talent and keeping them in the communities? Because if you bring someone up, that's costing the municipality $50,000 to train them. And if they leave after two years, that's another $50,000. Is there succession planning? Oh, it's like I know what you guys are talking about earlier. <laughs> uh, is there succession planning that needs to happen in the territory to keep more good talent in the uh, territory? That's a great question. And so I'm a big believer in homegrown talent. I was lucky enough to live in a small community I was the SAO there in Tulida, which is at the on the Mackenzie River where the Bear River empties, empties into it in the Sotu region, which is breathtakingly beautiful. Mountains and rivers and absolutely beautiful. And it was how like people are smart. There's opportunities for people there. You need to have an, an education to do it. So we need to make sure that local and Northwest Territories residents go to university. Uh, it's a pet peeve of mine. And, and the city has certainly been advocating that we are pushing hard to collaborate with the GNWT to get a university here. That's a big part of it. Part of it is knowing what the job is. And so there's a number of different things at the city of Yellowknife. And this is testimonials that people have said who are either here, the things that keep them here, or things that they're, oh, this is what I'm going to miss because I'm moving home, but closer to home to, to have my kids closer to grandma and grandpa. Planners. Planners come to Yellowknife, and if they were in a larger city, they would be working on, I'm a fresh, I'm a planner straight out of school, yay. Uh, they'd be working on decks and fences, right? That's what they would be working on, and that would be it, and they would want to, they'd be bored out of their tree. Like, you learn that stuff, that's great. But our planners do decks and fences, and then they're pulled into uh, a, a development permit appeal. And they're there because they weren't the planner that made that decision. But come on, you're coming in because we need you to be the note taker. You have to be the one that's understood. So there is a diversity of opportunities that people have when they come into the workplace in the north. And that, to me, is one of the most amazing things. Our firefighters as well. We have a dual uh, dual uh, program right now. So our, we are emergency medical services, EMS, and firefighting. And so we have primary care paramedics that are also firefighters. And so... They will come in and say, you know what, if I was at the fire department in some big city, I would have one defined role that I would be doing all the time as the probie, as the new guy until I passed my probation and went through the, the process of being, you know, the, the levels of being a firefighter. I'd be very limited in what I can do. But here I start off and I have that I'm starting at the bottom and I'm starting doing the basic things, but I'm also thrown into situations where I am with my platoon and the organization is responding to something where I have a role that's bigger than just being in charge of the hose, just being doing whatever. So the opportunities that are here for the diversity and the opportunities to grow your career are pretty astounding. And I do need to say, I've been like, at, when I, um, when I decided it was my time, my, my time to say, I think I, I need to move along. I was really struck by that study that's been done that looks at the turnover of CAOs in Alberta, right? So Northwest Territories has been doing pretty good compared to that. And so that is a tough nut to crack in the profession overall. And so I'm really hopeful that there's, you know, I know there's a lot of academic work going on right now to look at how come there's this two-year turnover? Why is, why is 
why is the role of CAO not attractive and not stable in Alberta? And I don't think Alberta is the only place. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we're feeling this across the country. I think, you know, it might be a, a chalk it up to a number of things, whether or not it's the lack of civility overall in society, whether or not it's, you know, making sure that council and SAO can get along and have a really strong foundation for their professional working relationship. Lots of reasons. Um, you know, I, I had to say to my mayor and council that bittersweet for me, but I, 2023, you know, was a pretty intense year for Yellowknife. And it was and coming on the heels of COVID where I found I could not do my job. I can't do this job in 8.30 to 5, Monday to Friday. It just doesn't work that way. So it's always, I'm here till seven and I'm, you know, just my husband and the dogs at home, lucky that my, you know, my kids are grown and that's not a factor anymore, but uh, I have to work one day on the weekend or I can't stay on top of things. And then there is always the, I'm going to the grocery store because we're out of oranges. And someone will say, and my husband has a joke, he thinks I should take a shot every time someone says, do you know what the city should do? Hey, you know, I've got a great idea for you. The city should think about, yeah, that's awesome. That's an awesome idea. And I often people come with the best of intentions and they really, really want to see good things happen in their community. And it's based on, predicated on the fact that they are taking for granted the core and essential services that get provided that people don't think about and that take an enormous amount of work to make sure that they are constant and reliable. And so when someone says, oh, I'd love it if we had our walking trails were turned into uh, skating trails all winter long, like that'd be so easy. Like, why don't you guys just do that? Oh, okay. Cause our walking trails, like we, in the summer, we hire summer students. And in the winter, we're, we have a skeleton crew of people that are dealing with outdoor facilities at that point in time. So great. Uh, how's that property tax increase looking to you? <laughs> and, I, and I get it because people come with genuine great ideas that they want to build community. And I love that. And I think it's so rewarding and so, um, so such a great thing that they want to do, but limited resources, limited people, pressures that we feel. No one likes to hear that we have a, you know, a lift station that basically takes all of the sewage, you know, and lift, there's a lift station in town that we have to pay attention to, or we're going to have a literal poop show. Um, people don't want to think about that stuff. It's not on their radar. And understandably, because everything is working seamlessly right now to make that go away. So the core and essential services became number one priority during COVID, right? That is where uh, our firefighters, our primary care paramedics, they continued to be out in the field and we had to make sure that they're protect their safety, number one, protect public safety after that. But but what it came down to was get everything else off the table except core and essential services, firefighters, water and sewer, roads and sidewalks so that streets are plowed so that ambulances can get to people's houses if they need to. We wanted to make sure that the, the most basic services were dealt with and they were dealt with efficiently. And that was a real wake up call in the world of municipal government as well. And certainly for my council, who at that time had said in their strategic directions that they wanted to set, hey, you know what? Core programs are going great. You guys are doing a great job. We're going to focus our priorities on the pivot points, the things we want to change in our four years. And that was, that was kind of a cool approach to take. They approved that in 2019 and then boof. Right into 2020, we had to say, bless your hearts, council. We we love what you've laid out here, but we're not going to do a whole lot more than really focus on what is important for those core and essential services and making sure we keep people safe. So the municipal world is just constantly a challenge. The context is constantly evolving, and we need to be the stability in there because people rely on the great things that we do. And the, the, I love waking up in the morning and taking for granted that I'm going to turn the coffee on because I have water. Water is not an issue. And if you don't have water because there's been a freeze up, a pipe is gone, a lift station has had an implosion of some sort, that is a terrible thing to go through. And so the unsung heroes of municipalities are those core and essential workers that are doing such incredible stuff for everybody's <laughs> safety. I, so we are doing a bit of a cross Canada tour here, Sheila. What, what your experience? You had a little bit in the south, quite a lot in the north. What are the ways you you see how local government operates differently in the Northwest Territories than say during the the south 
uh, south of 60 that most people may not think about. This, Chris has already made reference to the title of senior administrative officer rather than chief administrative officer, but that's only a minor one. It's a great question. And honestly, I think there are more similarities than differences. Sure. To, to be honest, I think, you know, Again, I was visiting family in India in fall of 2022, and I'm a geek. I had to go to city halls everywhere we went. Uh, believe it or not, there's people grinding away on property taxation in uh, Udaipur, just like here. So, you know, whether or not it's in the north compared to the south, I think our commonalities are much more pronounced than not. And certainly we see that when you have organizations like um, CAMA, uh, Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators, where you see people that are members from across the country. And this niggling issue that you're dealing with, you know what, dollars to donuts, someone on the East Coast is dealing with that as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, offhand, the difference is, I mean, I, I, for me, the difference is I will, I will not leave Yellowknife. I absolutely love Yellowknife. And so the, the lifestyle here is so fantastic. That to me makes the profession, um, you know, there's there's exciting things that we deal with. We have, you know, fun things like, like there's a bylaw. Uh, I think we've actually removed it, but I just love it and I hold it near and dear to my heart that there are no lions allowed to live in Yellowknife. Because at one time there was a guy who had a lion and he didn't put it on a leash and he walked his lion. Like, <laughs> who, who does this stuff, right? I mean, that's that's the joy of municipal government. Like these things are legendary. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes we have, um, you know, a, a bit of a libertarian streak in the north sometimes that it is what it is. Um, the differences, I don't think, are that. No, sorry. Let me go back. Maybe it is a difference. Thank you. I'm thinking it through a little bit now. I'm not just blathering. Well, I am blathering. But um, we are a capital city that is at the end of a highway. We're at the end point. Uh, and there is one road out. And there is uh, 1,200 miles between Yellowknife and the next largest community, which is Grand Prairie in Alberta. So when we, it's great that I can go and get my latte and I, you know, all the Indian spices in the world for my cooking, I can get everything here. We're a very cosmopolitan city. But when pressure comes down, as we saw in 2023, we don't have the ability to have mutual aid agreements. Um, when we saw fires going on in Kelowna, where, gosh, the fire is coming from the west, everybody moves east. Oh, it's coming from the east, everybody's going to drive west. We don't have the luxury of that here. And so it was a very, very challenging year in 2023, clearly with the fires and the evacuation that happened. An evacuation that, frankly, had not been contemplated uh, for the capital city of the territories. And so all of the government's plans are, hey, when if, if everyone comes to Yellowknife, and at the point where if Yellowknife needs to evacuate, it is an interjurisdictional thing where we're talking to Alberta. And that's exactly what happened. So I think that there is uh, the remoteness is an issue, but it makes people a lot more self-reliant. People have to come up with ways to deal with things that perhaps you may not need to because you have the luxury of mutual aid. You've got the luxury of some different ways of, of attesting to uh, how you do business in the South. So regionalization, of course, you know, in the south, that's a great thing. Economies of scale are there. So in the north, there are 33 communities in the Northwest Territories. Each one of them has a fire hall, right? So a community of 200 and uh, Yellowknife, everyone has a fire hall. Hmm. So the, mutual, the municipal infrastructure impacts are huge. They're, they're a big consideration. And so the economies of scale are not going to operate in the same way, but everyone is pretty creative because you're put in a situation where you need to be. You have to be creative to come up with some solutions of how you're going to work together. And the way that that often happens is you're going to look at other orders of government. And so we are, the population of the Northwest Territories is 50% Indigenous. There are a number of really progressive Indigenous governments that have signed some really groundbreaking uh, Indigenous rights agreements, self-government uh, agreements with the government of Canada. And they are neighbors to us, the Cho and the Satu and the Buchin. And so collaborations on that scale can be really interesting and really innovative. And so our neighbors, the Yellowknife Stene First Nation, they have uh, partially embedded in the city of Yellowknife and then part of their community is outside of the boundary. We, we have a really intimate working relationship with them. And that's an amazingly exciting way to make sure that we think about reconciliation in everyday ways. It's not just, you know, it's some very big important ceremony where we will talk about government to government. It's it's daily and it's daily to the point where 
uh, when I put a challenge out to all of our staff about how's reconciliation play out in your area of responsibility. And the, uh, the public works guys said, um, I don't think this applies to us, right? Because water, sewer, roads, like no one, that, that that's our business. There's nothing about that that has reconciliation. So, okay, whatever. But I tasked everyone, go away, think about it. And the public works guys were the ones that came back and said, yeah, we do stop signs. We do signage. So we could do a bilingual stop sign. And sure enough, like we've, we've gone and it's implemented throughout the community where it says stop in English and in the Willaday dialect that the Yellow Knives Dene First Nations speak. And so it gets lots of comments from tourists like, hey, what is this? And it's a great way to just open up that dialogue, open up the conversation about we are living on the traditional territory of the Yellow Knives Dene and this is their language and this is how they say stop and this is how we acknowledge and support that they are just woven into the fabric of this community in ways that are hopefully more meaningful because it's so every day in its nature. <laughs> I just have a follow-up question to that because you you mentioned they look at a stop sign and they see stop and then they see the Willowdale language as, as well. Um, hopefully they're stopping before they're moving on. <laughs> hopefully they realize <laughs> hopefully. that it is a stop sign. Um, I, I I have the I, I I've been tasked with asking the final question, and I've been jumping back and forth to try and figure out how to properly ask this question because you have come to the realization that it's time to move on. And as of recording this, you were weeks, if not days away from when this airs from handing in those keys to your office, handing in the keys, handing in the passes. Looking back on the last seven years, what's the one thing that you are going to take away that you go, you know what, I can walk away knowing that I have led an organization through some very tumultuous times through COVID-19, through a wildfire evacuation. Is there something that you're going to look back on and you say, I've left the community a better place than when I got there? That's a really tough question, Chris, because you never do anything alone. Right. And so I have had the absolute luxury of working with a dynamite mayor. Um, I've had the absolute luxury of having a senior leadership team that goes above and beyond uh, and a workforce that actually gives a crap about things. So um, I honestly, I get to stand on the shoulders of giants. Right. I look back and I reflect on the things that we've had to navigate through. And a lot of it is seat of the pants. But you know what? I, I'm um, I'm an aspiring um, amateur stand-up comedian. And so I think that really the work that we do, it's improv. And you're faced with a set of circumstances and you have to figure it out. And so it's a lot like improv. And so I leave here thinking that what I think I'm most proud of was developing and really strengthening the cohesive team uh, at the senior leadership team, that the management team, finding talent, identifying that, celebrating that, and being able to work effectively with council. Because if you're not all pulling in the same direction, it's it's just, you're going to be stuck in the state of paralysis and it's not going to be pretty. So there are many practical things that I'm proud of. I leave here as well going, oh God, I wish I'd done that differently. Or, oh man, no one saw that 10 mistakes a day that I made. And it's like, you, you get back on the horse and you have to try to figure it out next. Like any career and like any leadership position, you, you appreciate so much the talent that you get to work with. And I've been really, really blessed that way. <laughs> Sheila, it has been an honor to sit down and chat with you. And I feel like we've just scratched the surface. I, I know you said you're staying up in Yellowknife and I wish you all the best in future endeavors, wherever you land. I hope if it's municipal politics, maybe if you run for office one day, who knows, maybe those conversations at the grocery store will continue on. We don't know, but <laughs> thank you so much for joining us on the political trenches, uh, Sheila. It's been a wonderful experience to sit down and chat with you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ian. It's been an absolute honor. Thank you so much.